Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, exciting uh, event. My name is uh, Petros uh, Vambakis. I'm the uh, director of the Institute of Eastern Mediterranean Studies uh, here in uh, Boston. And it gives me a, a great pleasure this morning to uh, introduce uh, this uh, event in uh, discover discovering the fascinating world of the Aegean. Uh, with uh, really some um, amazing people that are doing some incredible work on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and I also want to thank the uh, Consul General of Greece for uh, having this uh, grand idea and putting this together and putting together, uh, uh, bringing together two uh, really uh, amazing institutions, uh, the, the uh, Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institute here in uh, Massachusetts and uh, the researcher who is there from Greece, uh, Dr. Melina Kouradidou, who is an environmental and resource economist uh, working uh, with fisheries, economics and management, as well as uh, invasive uh, species management. Her long-term research interests include interdisciplinary approaches that apply economics, ecology and biology to the environmental issues in order to improve management strategies and help ensure sustainable development and healthy, resilient ecosystems. Uh, Dr. Koradidu's uh, work uh, is grounded in fisheries management and governance issues with particular focus on the, in the Arctic. She has uh, international, an international experience having worked in Denmark for several years and at the University of Southern Denmark in Canada at Dalhousie University. Uh, here in the U.S. at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and is also in Greece at the Hellenic Center for Marine Research. Uh, but we will start out uh, with Dr. Anastasia Miu, who is a hydrobiologist and the scientific director of Archipelago's Institute of Marine Conservation. Uh, Dr. Miliu is also the Greek ambassador in the European Union for sustainable fisheries and maritime policy. Anastasia for the past 22 years has been living permanently uh, in various parts of the Greek seas, leading the journey of archipelagos for the protection of marine life. Uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Anastasia Miliu to, uh, to give us her presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, or good day, depending in which part of the um, Atlantic you are, in which part of the globe you are. Uh, I am uh, here in the Eastern Aegean on the research vessel, the Aegean Explorer. Uh, we're docked on the island of Lipsy, and uh, um, I, it's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to uh, share with you some of the fascinating um, recordings, information and videos that we uh, collect here in Archipelagos Institute, but also uh, share with you our concern on um, the future of marine life in Greece and uh, um, also our responsibility, if there's something we can do to protect this wildlife. Uh, Pedro, could you please uh, play the first video so we can uh, start seeing some images of the marine life uh, of the Aegean. Um, I think it will be great to, you know, a great way to start and uh, get a first feel of the Aegean. See if we can, we can do this. Can everybody see this? I think so. So the the everyone I think here uh, in this virtual room loves the Aegean. Uh, I think it's one of the most special places that we can be in order to be able, to, you know, to spend our summers and our holidays. But uh, sometimes the biodiversity, the marine life. Uh, that is hosted in this uh, beautiful sea is not really known. The species, uh, the inhabitants of the sea is who we share with. It is 
the magnificent sperm whales that uh, we record in the over the deep trenches, uh, especially during the migratory season of the spring and the autumn, but also the fish, the but huge biodiversity of different species that we monitor. This year especially has been a year when due to COVID there has been very little human presence and the marine life and especially fish has been those who have uh, responded positively to our absence. They enjoy uh, being in the sea without the constant presence and pressure caused by humans and uh, oh, this is some uh, cuttlefish, seagrass meadows and a lot of the uh, marine life that sometimes we do not uh, realize that needs our help to continue surviving. So the Aegean, its underwater gardens, its inhabitants, the turtles that uh, uh, just yesterday we've uh, heard of a new turtle nest in Patmos. All the islands have the uh, few uh, nests starting since the last two weeks and uh, which gives us a lot of responsibility to be able to guard them and protect them for the next 40 to 60 days until they hatch and they start the long journey in the seas. So the Aegean, the Greek seas, is not a, a, a seashore for only us to enjoy. It is a sea where a lot of different species call home as much as we do. They call this sea home, they enjoy the sunshine, they enjoy the beaches, and uh, sometimes they surprise us with behaviors like this young seal that uh, wants to be on boats and uh, is quite uh, special on, the, on its behavior and its uh, um, coexistence with humans. Very rare, very special, but uh, unique behaviors from individuals, from marine mammals who are um, very smart, very um, uh, wise, and they also call these beautiful water seas. And as I will explain more in detail later, it's not only we, what we can see, the deep waters that we cannot easily see, that we cannot uh, admire while snorkeling or diving, are equally important, equally diverse, and they are also habitats that need our protection. And now, uh, you, if I can share my screen, so I can show you some uh, more, uh, share with you some more information about the Aegean and the conservation work of uh, Archipelagos Institute. I hope, uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you, Petro. Uh, I'll start uh, with a few words about Archipelagos Institute. Archipelagos Institute of Marine Conservation is a Greek initiative. It was uh, created by a Greek uh, captain, a seaman who left the cargo ships uh, after many years of experiencing problems, but also the beauty of the seas, and decided to start an initiative that would lead a lot of uh, scientists and experts of different uh, uh, from different uh, backgrounds to join forces to protect the sea. So we're a Greek non-governmental organization. We are comprised of an international team of researchers and scientists and other professionals. And all together, we are dedicated to defending the biodiversity of the seas, to halt problems as much as possible in Greece and the Northeast Mediterranean. And here you can see the research vessel, the Aegean Explorer, where I am right now. So in the last 24 years, Archipelago is defending marine mammals and the coastal ecosystems, but also we monitor species, habitats, plastic pollution and other threats, but also the very special biodiversity on the land because the islands also host a very big diversity of species on land. So Archipelago is here to defend the biodiversity of the Northeast Mediterranean and uh, with a focus on the Greek seas and islands. And for this, we combine research, 
education, and the most important uh, conservation actions which are carried out with the community engagement. Archipelagos works together with the local communities in order to give, uh, to halt the ongoing problems. If you come to find us today in Lipsi, uh, next month so, and over the year in various parts of the Aegean, you'll find our three boats, the Aegean Explorer, Pinelope and Aftilos, that give us their mobile platforms for the marine research and conservation work throughout the region. Mainly we are in the Eastern Aegean, in Lipsi, in uh, Samos, in Icaria, and also have stations in Nusses and Leros, but through the boats, with the use of the boats, we are in different uh, parts of the, the of the GNC and up to Malta and up to the Central Mediterranean. Uh, thankfully, even though Archipelago started alone as a small group of people, over the years we managed to have a lot of supporters and partners who join efforts with us in order to protect this unique sea. Also, Archipelagos is a platform for education. Over 18,000 students have, uh, from various ages and backgrounds, mainly university students and postgraduates, but also uh, younger occasionally, join us in this endeavor to learn, to get inspired, and to uh, start their own mission in protecting the seas. So year round, uh, with Archipelagos, a lot of students carry out research and conservation work. So what I really want to discuss today about and open a small window uh, from uh, the Aegean uh, around the world through this mobile platform is to talk about this biodiversity hotspot. The Aegean is one of the most important biodiversity hotspots remaining in Europe and one of global importance. Marine mammals, sharks, fish, but also seabirds around the islets, they are only few of the spectacular wildlife that we share our seas with. Spectacular in the deep, spectacular in the shallow, with a big diversity of species that still survive around us. A biodiversity, however, then a wildlife that survived not because we protect it, but because of chance, because of the enforcement of protection measures, which makes me and my colleagues and a lot of other people here in Greece very concerned. It's a daily agony. Will this wildlife survive or will there be something that will make it end today that everyone speaks about protection of the environment? So please let me introduce to you some of the rare mammals of the Aegean, the rare species we share this sea with. And I couldn't start by anything else by the Mediterranean monk seal. The Mediterranean monk seal is highly endangered. There are about 400 to 600 Mediterranean monk seals surviving in the world. Only last week we found, two were found dead. And uh, uh, it is very, very worrying whether these species will survive, whether uh, children as they grow up uh, and are the main inhabitants of the islands, of the mainland in the, uh, near the coastline, they will see these species surviving or whether the Mediterranean monk seal will become extinct. If we, maybe we know about the monk seal, but the species that is very, very uh, little known by most of the people in Greece and abroad is our giant, the sperm whale. Even though the sperm whales were first uh, recorded and described by Aristoteles, two and a, uh, the philosopher, two and a half thousand years ago, and they are in our seas since then, it's quite unknown that uh, we have uh, such a significant population of the species. In the pictures, you see a young one, a young sperm whale that we recorded uh, last year who, when his mother dived, the sperm whales can dive to depths of over 1,000 meters. When the mother dived to uh, great depths, the young one decided to stay next to the boat and show off how good a uh, bridge, how good, uh, how well he can jump out of the water and what a big splash he can make. I could speak for sperm whales for hours, but I'll just say that they reach 50 tons in weight, 20 meters in length, and they are probably the, one of the smartest animals that have ever existed in the planet. So it's a, a real uh, learning experience every time 
we find them. A more rare way that is very difficult to spot and is avoiding human uh, presence as much as possible is the big way. The big way is found normally over deep sea trenches and it's a species that uh, sadly is very is highly threatened by noise pollution. Noise pollution by military ships is what causes big whales to uh, die. So we have to protect them mainly from noise pollution apart from the other threats. The whales are not so known, but we do uh, know better about the common dolphins, about the dolphins. So, but frequently people will say, I saw dolphins, but we don't realize there are four different species of dolphins that still survive in our seas. Um, the common dolphin, I like his name, it was uh, used to be a very rare species. And here in the Eastern Aegean, after eight years of search and never finding one, suddenly a population shifted. So now we have more than a hundred individuals over a large area, many babies, many youngs in the pod, which gives us hope that they will survive. In the open sea, together with a common dolphin, we see the striped dolphin. The striped, as you can see, has this distinct black stripe that starts from the eye and goes back um, throughout its body. And uh, we find it in the open sea in large pods that exceed 100, 200 individuals. In all dolphins, the adults stay uh, together because they can hunt, they can swim fast, they can dive deep. And the mothers and the young stay in the school groups. The mother, a, a young dolphin will stay with its mother for at least four years. They have to learn to communicate, they have to learn to dive, they have to learn to fish. And the mothers are very caring and they invest a lot of time to training their young. A very unknown species of dolphin is the resource dolphin that we find in the open sea. Resource dolphins migrate. We see them very few times per year. They migrate, they stay for a few days, and then they disappear to other places that we don't really yet know exactly where they'll be. When they're young, they are gray. And uh, as they grow older, they become white and their body is covered by markings. Markings that can, uh, are very distinct and can be caused either by fights between them or with their prey. As we see with the resource dolphin of the picture. They are magnificent animals that we know very little about. A more well-known species of dolphin is uh, the bottlenose. The bottlenose is a dolphin that is close to the shore. It's quite a naughty species. It's the one that, that does cause damage to fishermen's nets and always causes interactions that are uh, a problem. As fish are getting less and dolphins and fishermen share the same food, there's always a conflict, a conflict that is very important for us at Archipelagos Institute to address. But um, if Petros can play the video uh, that was captured uh, three weeks ago, you can see a unique uh, um, uh, discussion by dolphins. So if the sound is loud, we will all enjoy this unique video that was uh, captured so recently. Let's see if we can give this. Until the video starts, I can explain that dolphins, uh, they have very complex dialogues and very complex uh, communication skills. So as they communicate uh, between them, they have grammar similar to ours. They have phrases, they have their own names, which by which they're called by other individuals. That's why it actually takes so long for the mothers to train the young to be able to master dolphin communication, a science that is uh, uh, very new. And here we can just enjoy their discussion.
uh, going back to uh, thank you, Petra, for the video. Uh, going back to the dolphins, uh, I will need to say that we are always amazed by how bright they are, how uh, much they can understand when a boat is a threat, when humans are threat or not. They understand the, the interactions are quite uh, incredible, but we have to realize also that they are the species, the animals that are so much more under threat because of how much we humans exploit the seas. And um, I'll talk about dolphins in a little bit again, but before then I wanted to uh, discuss a little bit about our forest. The forest, of, in, the, in the land we have forests, we all know them, in the sea we have even more important forests that we are normally unaware of. The forest of our seas in Greece are called Posidonia, Livatia Posidonia, the Posidonia seagrass meadows, which are forming dense meadows in the seafloor from the shallow to 50 meters depth. The Posidonia meadows is where all life begins at sea. It's a nursery for fish and many other species. It releases valuable oxygen and they're very important for the biodiversity of our seas. A bit deeper, we have uh, another type of forest, if I can call it as such, our Coralligen reefs. Uh, they are very rich habitat, they're very unknown. And if Pedros would like to play the video with the corals, I can tell you a little bit about these highly unknown habitats. The footage was captured last Monday. It was quite um, it was a target to find these uh, habitats. They're called, uh, this is uh, the zone called Mesophotic zone, a zone that has quite um, um, average, low, but not too low amount of light. Uh, if it's possible better to play the video with the corals um, and that is so that we can see this, may, you're some of the first people to share, to see this uh, uh, unique footage captured by the ROV. Pedro, is it possible to, or uh, someone to yeah, play I'm the really, video? I'm having a difficult time accessing that okay. one. Okay, don't uh, worry. Let me give it another try, uh, see if we okay. can uh, turn that up. That's no problem. So the ROV is a new technology that is playing, uh, is allowing us to explore the deep waters um, over uh, the coral region will start at 50 meters depth. It will reach over 150, 200 meters depth. And uh, in some region of the Aegean, the um, coral uh, reefs have been found to exceed over 7,000 years of age. They grow very slowly at only a few millimeters per year, which means that, uh, thank you very much for sharing this, which means that when we destroy them, the destruction is irreversible. When we destroy the coralliginous reef, here you can see a great biodiversity of sponges. A few corals are a little bit deeper. The colors impress us, the diversity of the organisms impress us, and the value of these ecosystems is incredible for the health and productivity of our seas. The, um, these habitats are in need of our protection. In Greece, we do not enforce any legislation to protect them, which means that if uh, the reason that they're still alive is because no trawler, no big fishing boat that dredges the seafloor happened to pass over them. No ghost net happened to cover them and no explosion happened to destroy them. So we are lucky. We are lucky that the coralliginous habitat still survive. We are very fortunate that they are still um, in our seas and they still uh, give this immense uh, diversity, but also beauty, but it's a big um, uh, stress and a big responsibility to be able to change the laws, to uh, ensure the enforcement of the law is happening in order to be able to protect these habitats. 
they are beyond diving depth, so it's impossible to dive and see them. But uh, thankfully, through ROVs, through later technology, we're able not only to observe them, but soon we'll be able to share the images and live stream the images that we monitor so that it's not only us who observe them, it's other scientists, people who are concerned, sharing the knowledge, but also sharing the responsibility to protect this valuable and very unknown uh, habitats of the, what we call the mesophotic zone. And oh, here you can see a very uh, friendly lobster. Lobsters do find these as a key habitats and many other species of fish and invertebrates find a safe shelter in these locations. So I'm sharing with you my screen again to continue the, uh, this quick overview of our seas and their habitats. And um, again, um, if Petros can uh, share uh, the video, the Sanctuary Bay uh, video, uh, it will be an opportunity to share with you what happens right now. This is all footage again from the last few weeks. The last few weeks we have devoted it into filming and filming with the ROV because it's a very unique time. Um, the footage that you will see and this picture as well uh, shows a large aggregation of fish. This year is a very special year. The um, uh, species that are found in the um, in these waters uh, are not being fished, are not being fished because of COVID. The main fish markets have been closed for many years. Fishermen don't fish so much. So as a result, the, um, um, there has been very little human disturbance. So fish come to the shallows, humans are not waiting for them to catch them as they normally do in breeding time. And as a result, they um, stay for longer. And this will be, again, a very successful year. Like last year, little fishing means that the fish were allowed to breed and to, uh, so next year's we hope to see more fish, more fish for the dolphins, more fish for the seals, more fish for us humans, and a more productive marine habitat. Um, as I assume that this video is not uh, uh, going to play, uh, maybe we could go to the next one and I'll jump to um, another uh, very important topic for Archipelagos, uh, the Aegean Marine Life Sanctuary. The Aegean Marine Life Sanctuary, we can uh, see the video here, is... Um, oh, this is the... Uh, This is the video of the Sanctuary Bay. It's just having a hard time with it. Let me uh, open it up again. Sorry about this. All right, I think we got it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Petra, for doing all this effort. Here you can see the Bay of the Aegean Marine Life Sanctuary. This is the key project for us at Archipelagos, a small bay which will become a site for formerly captive dolphins. But until I explain you about that, let's look a bit about the species I just mentioned. The fish are come here, they don't have the disturbance of humans, they don't have the stress of human presence. And it's quite impressive how they come and they stay in the shallows for many days uh, where they will breed, they will, find, they will find a safe shelter. And these are the barracudas that are gathering more and more in numbers. And over the next uh, weeks, they, uh, it's, they, we can see this impressive 
uh, breathing ritual, this dance that they do in the sea, which just lets us observe them and admire how uh, what beauty still exists in the Greek seas. The seas that we do not protect, the seas that we do not uh, as much as we should, but I really believe that as we get to know them and as we get to understand them, we will be, each of us, a better uh, guardian of the seas, a better ambassador for their protection. A small octopus and the uh, cuttlefish. Cuttlefish were last uh, Wednesday when they started breeding inside the sanctuary, and you probably can see the female laying the eggs and the male following her in order to fertilize them. They were it's just an impressive image that uh, and it's the time for us as marine biologists to sit back and observe and learn about them. And the forest of our seas, the forest of our seas are where all life starts, all life is uh, um, the most important habitat and everyone gathers together. Oh, and it's incredible how many different species can coexist and can together um, uh, be part of this very wealthy ecosystem. So these are the Posidonia seagrass meadows and the uh, very impressive fish that they exist there. And I need to slowly introduce to you an effort that we're doing here in Archipelagos Institute as we monitor many seagrass meadows to be uh, destroyed. We have started the last three years to be replanting. This week we are planting uh, our different gardens using different techniques and different methodologies because it's quite difficult. We all know possibly how difficult it is to take care and how much effort it needs to take care of a garden in the land. In the sea, it's even more uh, complicated. It's, um, uh, we need to learn in order to be able to share this to others. As we have been observing over the last years, our uh, forest, the forest of the seas to disappear, uh, we started replanting them in order to be able to reverse this uh, damage. So I'm sharing with you my screen again. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, it will be very, but um, I think I have to go back very fast to where we were before. So uh, I mentioned that all this spring underwater or this impressive life was at the Aegean Marine Life Sanctuary Bay. What is the Aegean Marine Life Sanctuary? Uh, you know, as Greeks, we I think we share the long tradition of respecting and honoring dolphins. We were the first country to protect dolphins by law two and a half thousand years ago. And here in Lipsi Island, the um, archipelagos is working to complete the creation of the Aegean Marine Life Sanctuary. What aiming to bring back the respect to dolphins and other marine life here on the northern the Decanese. The Aegean Marine Life Sanctuary is very important as a hospital for injured marine life, for seals, turtles, and dolphins, but also it's going to be a sanctuary, the first in the world for formerly captive dolphins. Uh, a place where dolphins released from captivity, from the forced performances they have to carry out in zoos, they will have a retirement home in the Bay of the GMI Life Sanctuary. And also at the same time, it's a site research and education, innovative marine research and education. This is the Marine Life Sanctuary Bay and Petros will uh, try and play the video showing uh, a glimpse of the sanctuary and how it is constructed. Um, the sanctuary, until the video starts, I can say that the sanctuary started initially for the need of making a hospital for marine life. Here in Archipelagos, we have spent endless hours, uh, 48 hours and more, holding a dolphin in you know, shallow waters to protect them. Now, uh, we are trying to bring back respect to the special animals. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Pedro. Uh, the sanctuary is our bet. I think we are winning it. We are uh, completing a phase of construction. We just completed this week a phase of construction. Um, a lot of very uh, hard work is carried out. It's about 40 members in Next Pedagogy team right now from all over the world, from Europe, from US, from Australia. Despite COVID, we managed to stay on site and we spend this very difficult time in isolation in the sanctuary in Lipsy Island to make this endeavor happen. So it is very uh, yeah, important for us that it is progressing. I'm trying to move the screen so you probably let me share it again so it shows it. Um, better. So the sanctuary will address the problems of um, strandings of injured dolphins that need a hospital, but there are many more threats. I will need a whole new session to explain the threats, but very briefly, I need to bring to light some very important problems. We have great problems of overfishing, not only legal, but mainly illegal fishing. And sadly, in Greece, our seas and our marine life is suffering by illegal trawling, by uh, destructive fishing from Greek, Italian, Turkish and other vessels, but also even the unacceptable uh, uh, incidence of dynamite fishing that causes a great damage and still take a place in our seas. Many problems that but I'll mention the key one and I'll tell you that what is probably the most important. The Greek seas and especially the Aegean are suffering from uh, are at very high risk of accident. Every minute you can see on the left this very chaotic uh, diagram with the red lines. These red lines show the different traffic routes, maritime traffic routes. Uh, traffic is everywhere. There's no control. They, in most parts of the world, there are distinct uh, sea lanes that ships follow. In Greece, we have this total chaos and then um, a big maritime accident is at risk of happening every day. For us at Archipelago, the key uh, target to the different uh, political leaderships of the country at different times is this. The and what we try to communicate is that if we have a mechanism to prevent uh, a maritime accident, it will be definitely cheaper and more efficient than having to deal with the consequences of the many accidents uh, that can happen and risk to happen every day. One accident could be the end of all this important diversity. But maybe there's not a lot that people, most people can do about maritime accidents or about overfishing, but there is something that is a growing global pro problem a problem that we all contribute towards and we can start stopping. And this is the plastic, the huge problem of plastics that eventually enter the food chain and poison our seas and marine life. And you can see a bottle breaking down in the past when we used to be told that plastics break down in hundreds of years. Some types of plastic, especially plastic bottles and other light types of plastic in the, with the effect of the sunlight and the wave action in the soil will break down in a matter of few, several weeks or a few months, which means they will enter the food chain, they will become small fragments and be very, very harmful for marine life. Something scary, when we, did, uh, we tried to find the extent, the rate of how much plastic goes in our seas and how much plastic is uh, and how much, uh, what is the real 
uh, composition of the uh, debris coming in our seas. A, a team here at Archipelagos here started monitoring, monitoring in seven stations once a week, uh, different uh, the amount of uh, um, debris, what the sea washes out, and what the people may leave in these monitoring stations. It's not very popular location, so mainly the debris we found came from the sea. And after 937 surveys, we found over 31,000 single-use plastic items, cups, uh, straws, and uh, Q-tips, different items that people use in their daily life, and made their way into the sea and into the beaches. Over 13,000 of them were single-use plastic bottles. So what I'm trying to say here is that sometimes we see, okay, it's just one extra plastic uh, cup, that's one extra, uh, one extra straw. It's not a big day. Yes, it is a big day. We all contribute to the plastic problem, and if we cannot do a lot to combat illegal fishing, destructive fishing, or a maritime accident, we can do a lot to combat plastic pollution. Embarrassingly, Greece is really uh, bad in managing uh, waste. Sometimes we call it management by dispersion. It's a negative, another negative big innovation because we have so many illegal rubbish pits which operate on the islands, operate in the mainland, and when we the the waste, the rubbish is exposed to the winds, it ends up in our seas, it ends up on our ecosystem. So it's not only to blame those who go at the sea and pollute, but mainly we don't have the infrastructure to limit this. And that's a very, very important challenge and for everyone to exert pressure for this problem to change. When this rubbish is managed by dispersion, or as we say, enters our seas, breaks down with the effect of the sun and of the salt and the effect of the um, um, wave action becomes to very small pieces, it breaks down in very small pieces and then it breaks down into fibers. On the right image you can see, on the far right, the round image, you can see a fiber that we find down the microscope and on the left this is 58 small pieces of plastic that we found in the digestive tract of one young sea turtle, a turtle that died because of this uh, ingestion and it's one of the many victims of the plastics that are end up in our seas. I have to say that in the, the digestive cracks of 18 sea turtles we found over three and a half thousand fibers and fragments of plastics and in all microplastics were also found in all fish and seafood. So that doesn't mean we don't eat seafood. Of course we eat seafood and if we can find sustainable seafood, this means that, you know, it's a good food and it's, a, it's good for us and we should prefer it. We should realize though that our behavior, our daily life, our routine is damaging it. And we have the ability to make a change and influence the people around us to make this change. So a message from our seas, a message from my life, uh, there's a lot each of us can do, uh, depending who we are, what we can do, who we can influence. But something that each and every one of us can do is reduce our daily footprint to the environment. There's many ways by which, you know, everything you consume, everything you wash down the drain ends up in the sea. So make sustainable choices on what we eat or what cleaning products we use on the single-use plastics that we should stop buying and stop consuming and so many more. Is that there are so many ways each of us can reduce our footprint and we don't do it for ourselves only, we do it for the environment and we should realize that we share this amazing planet and these amazing seas with so many species that depend on us. They need our help to be able to survive. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you uh, we can have your help and your support to protect the Greek seas and also it's very important to get to learn them, to admire them, to observe them, to understand them better in order to be able to protect them. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, let's see now with, uh, what we've heard, the great work that's being done on one side of the Atlantic 
Uh, let's see if we can uh, switch and look at this side of the Atlantic and see some of the great work that's being done here at uh, Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic uh, Institute. Just bear with me with uh, technology here that I'm having a, a, a difficult time uh, this morning. So uh, we'll see what we can do and share my, uh, share my screen. You can do this. Okay, here we are. Let's find out uh, what's being done at uh, Woods Hall and what uh, Dr. Molina Guradidu has been doing there. Uh, so we'll play a short little video about uh, Woods Hall itself and see what we can hear from that. The oceans, the atmosphere, the interior of the earth, life, everything is connected. We are all linked in our research by our passion for the ocean. Hui is an amazing place full of extraordinary people who are truly curious about the ocean and want to understand how it works. How it interacts with the rest of planetary systems, how humans influence it. The physics, the geology, the chemistry, the biology, the interaction with human society. Mm -hmm. it's all from the beginning. The oceans, the atmosphere, the interior of the earth, life, everything is connected. We are all linked in our research by our passion for the ocean. Hui is an amazing place full of extraordinary people who are truly curious about the ocean and want to understand how it works. How it interacts with the rest of planetary systems, how humans influence it. The physics, the geology, the chemistry, the biology, the interaction with human society. It's all connected. What Hui does is it brings all those scientists together. The world's best talent in ocean science. We learn from each other, we develop opportunities together. It's a force multiplier. It feels like 130,000 scientists. I can pull together a team from either my department or other departments at Hui to really tackle any problem. Having all the support is what makes Hui unique and enables me to do good science. Hui is at the cutting edge of that mix between science and engineering and allows us to ask questions that most other places can't ask. You can come up with ideas, put them into action, and actually deliver results all in a short time. Vehicle technology, AV technology, seafloor instrumentation, sensor development. You get the world-class reputation, but you've also got amazing ships and engineering that allow you access to places that most other scientists can't get to. You can see further, you can go further, you can reduce your risk, and you can do it less expensively. It's really amazing for me to be able to walk out of my lab, cross the street, and get on to a research vessel that can take me anywhere around the world. I've been to remote reefs in the Maldives and Micronesia. I've dived on both the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the East Pacific Rise, and very few people have actually been down and seen that. We looked at the turbulent storms in the ocean and how they create upwellings of nutrients. We're able to collect samples and see how these systems change in real time. Just imagine you are diving, you are reaching the bottom of the seamount. All of a sudden you see a cloud. As we get closer, we see these objects that were aggregated like in a mass. And we say, what is that? The sense of isolation, you can almost feel the ocean closing over your head as you submerge. You can learn a tremendous amount just by being in the environment. Some things have struck me in the middle of the night and it clicks and you're like, oh my gosh, this is something really huge. It's that aspect of discovery, finding out something new, something that's never been seen before, creates an incredible drive within Hui scientists, engineers, and technicians. It's such a compelling place to be so dynamic and so many opportunities that it attracts really smart and dedicated students and young scientists. So I was reading those papers about amazing science that was coming out of Hui. Now that I'm here, I get to actually interact with the people who wrote those papers. The positive feedback and the collaboration finally made me decide, oh, I want to be a scientist. Oh, I can be a scientist. It's incumbent on us to perpetuate the cycle of education and research and discovery. People all over the world need to recognize the role that the ocean plays in their daily life. Even if they don't live near the coast, it affects weather, it affects food resources, it affects climate. Tides are changing, the temperature's changing, the 
Earth's land is changing. Climate change and overfishing are the biggest threats to coral reefs right now. How will the ocean respond to global warming? We have to understand our planet in order to be good stewards of it. We need to get the understanding into the hands of everyone from the general public to people responsible for making policy decisions. It's probably more important now than it ever was. We are very eager to provide answers for those critical questions that we must address now, and we have the tools and the means to provide these answers. This is the best place on the planet to do the sorts of things that we're doing. Institutions around the world look to Hui as a leader in pushing the envelope. Concepts that were developed here are understood as the basis for oceanography all over the world. I'm proud to be from Hui. There's no place on Earth I'd rather be. We have the potential to change the world. It's not just about this planet, it's about life in the broadest possible terms. Well, uh, thank you, Petrus, for showing this video about uh, Woods Hole and Graphic Institution. And uh, thank you, Anastasia, for the excellent presentation and uh, the fabulous videos. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, Petrus, if you want to uh, play the, uh, the presentation, that'd be great. And I'm well, happy I'll to do it. See if we can see that. Can everybody see it? Hello, everyone. My name is Melina Kulantidou, and I'm talking to you today from Beautiful Woods Hall in Massachusetts. Now that you've all watched this video, you probably have a better idea of what the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution does. Before I tell you more about what I do and how I found myself here, let's go through some fun facts about the ocean and understand why it is so important to study it and to protect it. The ocean covers 71% of our planet's surface and has 97% of our water. However, out of the 70% of ocean on our planet, we are only able to see 20% of it. The ocean produces half of the oxygen we breathe. It transports heat from the equator to the poles, regulating our climate and weather patterns. Ocean waters have absorbed most of human-caused global warming. Did you also know that they host about 90% of the Earth's volcanic activity. Furthermore, about 40% of the world's population lives within 60 miles of the coast. More than 3 billion people rely on the ocean for their livelihoods, and most of them are in developing countries. Also, more than 320 million jobs are linked to fisheries. In 2018, our oceans produced close to 84 million tons of fish. Unfortunately, however, not all of it was fished sustainably. But the ocean provides so much more than just seafood. Ingredients from the sea are found in so many other products we consume and are even used for uh, medicinal purposes and products. These are only a few of the reasons why we must all work together to protect our oceans. By training, I am a marine resource economist interested in understanding the value of our oceans to our society and our economy and the relationships of humans with the marine environment. I have been particularly interested in fisheries and the ways in which we manage them for the benefit of all in society. I grew up in Greece, close to the coast. For my education as a scientist, I moved to Scandinavia and Denmark in specific, and became interested in Arctic marine ecosystems and fisheries in particular on the northern coast of Norway. Then I moved to Canada and worked with indigenous communities in the Canadian Arctic. 
And after that, I found myself in Woods Hall, Massachusetts, working for exciting projects related to the coasts and the oceans. So let me walk you through some of my work. The Arctic is a fascinating place. However, climate change is a real and serious threat for the Arctic marine environment. The melting ice because of climate change is only one of the many problems. The warming waters of the Arctic are allowing for more anthropogenic activities to disturb this pristine environment. Climate warming and increasing anthropogenic activity also allow for species to move and establish new areas, negatively impacting the environment and the economy. I have spent a lot of time working with invasive crabs in the European part of the Arctic, and specifically these two large crab species, the red king crab and the snow crab. These crabs, which do not belong there, are causing important environmental damages to the bottom of the ocean, eating a number of other marine organisms. At the same time, people like to eat them, and some fishers have started living off of the fishery for these crabs, which makes it a hard problem to solve. I also had the luck to work with indigenous communities who live in the eastern part of the Canadian Arctic, and that was a fascinating experience. The livelihoods of people in these communities are strongly connected to the ocean, and fish is an important part of their diet. I learned a lot working with these communities, their way of life, their connection to the ocean and marine organisms from fish such as salmon and arctic char to marine mammals such as seals, whales and polar bears. Most important, I got to understand more about their traditional knowledge about fishing and the marine environment and also about their values which are oftentimes different than those we have in the western world. Coming back to Massachusetts at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, I started working for a fascinating part of the ocean called the Ocean Twilight Zone, often known as the Mesopelagic Zone. This zone of the ocean is found in waters from 200 to 1000 meters, just beyond the reach of sunlight and has some of the most fascinating fish and marine organisms you have ever seen. These organisms range in size from microscopic to among the largest on the planet. Some of them spend their lives in the shadowy depths of this zone, while others travel to and from the surface every day in the largest animal migration on Earth. At the moment, scientists know very little about it. However, they estimate that in the ocean twilight zone, there are about 10 billion ton tons of fish, which means that about 90% of all ocean fish live in the ocean twilight zone. And okay, fine, they glow, they glitter in complete darkness, they're fluorescent, they're fun to watch, but why should we care about them? Well, we should care for a number of different reasons. One of the most important reasons is that animals in the twilight zone help support the ocean's food web and transport huge amounts of carbon from surface waters into the deep ocean, helping to regulate in this way global climate. Through the food web, they, they also help support uh, fish which consume, uh, which humans consume, such as tuna, for example, or others such as dolphins, uh, sharks and whales. As we're discovering the ocean twilight zone, an interest is developing from the fishing industry to harvest these mesopelagic fish and other organisms because they can be used in aquaculture, such as for salmon, for example, or to produce fish oil, um, which is an important supplement for the human nutrition. In some parts of the world, it is possible that they also contribute to, to food and feed security, meaning that they play a role in human health and nutrition. But if people start fishing in the ocean twilight zone, then there is a big risk that we might lose biodiversity that we never got to know about in the first place. And with that, I want to close for today. So thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Here are some uh, resources that will also be shared in the chat with more information and material for you, uh, your parents and your teachers as well. Uh, I'll close with a two-minute uh, video on the fascinating, 
work that the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution team is doing on the ocean twilight zone. Dr. Currentito, you're muted. Yeah, thank you for this. Uh, if you can play the video on the Ocean Twilight Zone, that would be great. Okay, we're back. An intrepid team of scientists and engineers from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Okay, sorry about that. We are back. Um, so we have uh, plenty of questions and uh, as you can imagine, uh, these were outstanding uh, uh, presentations on both sides of the Atlantic, then we have a slew of questions. So we'll group the questions together and uh, see if uh, we can uh, go through them. Uh, Anastasia, can you see the questions? So we read the questions or are you able to, uh, to view them as well? And uh, Melina as well, yes. can you see the questions? Okay, um, maybe we can go through uh, some of the uh, questions as you are seeing them and maybe group some of the questions together and uh, see if we can have some answers. Um, at the beginning, I, I have to admit to everybody that uh, the Consul General, uh, Mr. Femu said, uh, if we have like a couple of questions, it will be great. And here we are with like a, uh, a cataclysmic uh, slew of questions. So uh, we can go on and I think it's a, it, it's an attribute to the, to the great success of both presentations and how uh, uh, really amazing they were. So Anastasia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, there's a lot to answer. Um, first question about machine learning to study dolphin communication. No, we don't use it so far. Uh, when the sanctuary operates, um, uh, we aim to have uh, permanent hydrophones uh, in the seafloor. 
so that we are able to uh, start uh, really studying um, dolphin communication. And then is when we aim to start um, machine uh, learning to become a, a part of the um, uh, process to monitor them. Uh, Dimitri Tadez sounds uh, from Italia, probably was the favorite part about researching marine life in the Aegean. Uh, Dimitra, the, um, um, I think, well, you know, after 25, 22 years here, I'm always amazed. It's, it's, it's more, you know, we keep discovering new things. By the way, you think you know a lot of things, of course, never everything. And we just start from zero again. You know, the, the sea teaches us a lot of things. It's very difficult to be 365 days per year at sea on boats with all the good and bad things that this uh, life and work entails. But, you know, it just, you know, the, the beauty of the sea and uh, really makes us uh, fascinated. Uh, and I think that's what all drives us all. And I'm sure it's just, you know, probably the same for Melina, I could guess, uh, but she can tell us herself also. Uh, how big the meadows, seagrass meadows can be. The seagrass meadows uh, cover large areas of, uh, you know, they can be um, uh, many acres long if we don't destroy them. So as long as you have a flat seafloor, like like here in the south of Deccanese, where the depths are not very big, you have extensive large meadows. And um, what I need to say is that here in the Eastern Aegean and the Aegean Sea, we have some of the last surviving meadows in the uh, Mediterranean Sea, the last extensive seagrass meadows. And um, this is a, a great fortune uh, because we, we do need them to have fishery, to have climate change. Um, the corals can exist for uh, several thousand years. Ioana Bubulas is asking. Uh, Ioana, uh, one study has aged corals. Uh, it was a study of a researcher from a Greek university a few years ago that they they, they aged corals to exceed 7,750, if I remember correctly, years of age. It was definitely more than 7. Uh, uh, 1,700 years. Um, there's not a lot more research done. Our ROV currently cannot sample for the hard corals, but we aim to be able to uh, rent specialized ROV units when we're in expeditions about this. Um, Evita Buri, uh, again about the Greek seas. Um, with plastic waste, garbage, and other pollutants that affect, unfortunately affect the Greek Sea inland waters. Uh, how much an impact has had on marine mammals? Uh, there is an impact. We have a lot of animals that we find uh, dead and or injured, and mammals, and also turtles tangled up with plastic, and that's. Uh, um, frequently we find the uh, bags, the uh, sacos that uh, contain animal food or other. They are normally a, a usual suspect for uh, entanglements as, as are nets. Uh, it's a huge problem and it's a growing problem. And sadly, not Greece nor Turkey are doing anything to address the problem of plastic pollution. So that's a real uh, you know, a, a big target, not for the battle, but I think for everyone to be able to address it. Jan Sabadakis, uh, since the secret is the foundation of marine life, how feasible is it to scale up your secret planting efforts? And artificial reefs to accelerate coral regeneration in areas where they survive and are damaged. Um, and finally, uh, are you hopeful that the Greek legislation can help with these efforts? Um, Seagrass replanting, I think within, by the end of 2021, we will have be confident on the methodology on seagrass replanting so we can share it with others because so it's efficient and can be carried out in a large scale. Then, yes, Yanni, we need the... Um, um, support of the Greek government and uh, in this effort. We have a lot of promises. We need to see actions. Uh, on Monday, we have a visit by the Deputy Minister of Environment. He plans to discuss this and more. I hope that these 
uh, promises become actions and I think that's you know very important for us to achieve. Uh, coral uh, replanting at the coral restoration I think that's, that's very difficult because of the depth at least uh, right now um, the so it is very but what uh, can be done is to protect what we have. It's cheaper, it's more efficient, and that, that is our target to, to halt the ongoing distractions. Uh, current mayor MPA status. Marine protected areas in Greece are two, and they're not efficient, and they are very bureaucratic. They are very difficult to manage. And uh, especially the Zakynthos Marine Park is really, really poorly managed. It's, it's, it's sad to see such an area being tangled up in such a bureaucratic chaos. I think the future for Greece and for many other parts of the world is the bottom-up approach, protection that starts from the local communities, gives their own local communities with scientists, of course, and the scientific advice. But if the, the locals are those who lead these efforts, we have better hope. The marine parks and protected areas in general in Greece, they're so bureaucratic that it's, it's inhibiting their efficiency. And it's really sad to see efforts of good people trying to make a change being uh, hitting a wall in uh, what we probably all know as the mountain of Greek bureaucracy. And someone asked about internships in archipelagos and if they are paid or the accommodation. We do host internships. We do have a number of international interns year round. And the interns normally use either uh, grants from the universities or from other organizations to cover their accommodation and travel and living expenses. Um, uh, if Taxiade is being so close to Turkey, do you interact with Turkish authorities concerning conservation issues? Um, especially in the previous years, we had a very close cooperation with Turkish universities. We still have actually, and with Turkish NGOs. Uh, it's very difficult with Turkish authorities, especially with the current government. And in an ideal world, the Aegean would cooperate, the two sides of the Aegean would cooperate to prevent accidents, to manage fisheries. I think as people, we get along, as scientists and conservationists, we really agree on priorities, politics in this part of the world, and not only are causing a problem for the past centuries, especially in the Aegean. So even though we should work together, we don't as countries. And that's another target to have. We do interact with Turkish fishing boats and illegal Turkish fishing boats. But again, there's very little support both from Greek and Turkish authorities to stop illegal fishing by Turkish vessels, which adds on to the Greek problems that are caused by the Greek fleet. Someone else is asking uh, anonymous attendee uh, uh, about any noticeable socio-ecological impacts on the marine environment as a consequence of refugees crossing the Aegean Sea. We have had a lot of um, problems because of the debris aggregating in the coast and spreading, but having experienced this in first time and having spent endless hours, not only me, but all the archipelago's team and of course the local communities helping refugees, you know, you can't talk about plastic debris when you witness the tragedies people are going through. So I think, you know, the balance is um, turning, you know, of course, a priority should be human life and supporting humans. Uh, so we, well, I don't think we're allowed to speak about the plastic, but it is a huge problem that should be addressed. But first we should help, you know, people should be helped first before anything else in the condition that they go through. Dimitri Tzades, are there specific marine animals that are found in the seas of Icaria? Icaria is very special to me, Dimitra, and we've spent years working in the area. The deep trench in the north of the island is one of the most fascinating parts of the world for me. Um, sperm whales, big whales, resource dolphins, common dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, monk seals, and the sea otters on the land are only from and corals on the deep are some of the very few 
special inhabitants of uh, your special island is, you know, uh, what can I say about Italy, about the, the trench in the north is just incredible. Are there any sanctuary type uh, TFXIADIS uh, areas in Samos and limits to fishing? No, only what applies for the whole of Greece. So no limits to fishing and Samos is a very difficult island to enforce these uh, measures. The smaller islands like here, like in Lipsy are quite more easy to uh, promote conservation. Islands that have easy tourism, a lot of cash flow in previous years are more spoiled, are more difficult to be convinced that fishing needs to be managed. So that would need uh, uh, also a more governmental approach. My God, a lot of questions. Amazing. I'm, I'm so glad there's such an interest from so many people. Um, what government's recent efforts to promote and embrace sustainability in Greece? Uh, are there increased action to crack on illegal landfills? If not, I think it's a great opportunity to push back and say it's much more to do for sustainability. Um, uh, there's not enough done. There's definitely not enough done. There's a lot of announcements, there are a lot of wishes, a lot of uh, things. What made me really concerned about the approach this country is taking is when last year, I, I will not name the island, but in several islands where there's not even basic light fields, big, big touristic popular islands, they had big posters saying that they're go plastic free. It's like they try to fool the visitors and to train the locals that we can still lie and people who visit us are stupid and don't understand. So no, we have illegal landfills, burning rubbish, even now that we speak, there's a lot of landfills and I think that the, the landfills as they uh, operate in a lot of places are a problem. But to say the positive, there are also places here in Lipsy Island, for example, there are uh, areas where, you know, they have an incredible waste management, a small community, 800 locals managed to organize recycling, get profit from it for the community. So there are the bright exceptions, but it's still their exceptions. Are you, Mich Michael Yesemidis, um, are you concerned that plastic hurts fish or do you support eating sustainable fish, how they die and why they die does not matter? I think that, you know, when you talk about sustainable fishing, when you are on a small Greek island where you have a boat that will uh, be, you know, employ one fisherman, give uh, employment, uh, you know, uh, profit for uh, profit, give the income for a family to survive, will catch five kilos of fish, 10 kilos of fish on a selective manner, then yes, it can be sustainable. Uh, it's difficult when you're in a city to be able to judge where fish that you eat and select are sustainable, but there are ways that this can be done in a local or a, a nation, uh, in, a, in a country. So I do I am pro sustainable features. I think it is possible. It's a long discussion, and I think we would need a whole session on its own about it. Um, Melina, do you want to jump in on sustainable fishing? I think it's becoming a very popular topic as uh, whether fish can be sustainable. Yeah, well, uh, that's a big question and a challenging one to answer. Uh, I'm, I'm going to answer first a couple of questions about the ocean twilight zone, and then let's let's get back to this. So there was a question about uh, um, what are um, what is it? <laughs> There's so many questions in the chat uh, about uh, I guess the uh, the carbon mechanisms uh, in the ocean twilight zone. Um, and I just wanted to, to clarify that uh, there's this process known as the carbon pump in the ocean twilight zone. Um, so as the ocean's uh, mid layer um, powers up uh, much of the ocean's uh, life, that's how carbon is uh, stored and captured. So the, basically the organisms in the, in the twilight zone are eating this uh, carbon on a daily basis, coming up at night to feed and hiding in the depths uh, at night eating and sifting the carbon through the ocean's layers. 
Uh, and so when organisms in the in the twilight zone die, they decompose and uh, join the rest of the, the carbon matter that's sinking down. Now, uh, there was also a question uh, about whether there is um, destruction and uh, damage on ocean twilight zone fish. And um, my answer to that is that the, there is no large scale commercial fishing yet in the ocean twilight zone. It has been uh, attempted in different parts uh, of the world, such as in um, Iceland, Norway, uh, Saudi Arabia, by the Soviet Union in Antarctica. But it, it seems like it's, it's, it hasn't been very successful uh, or profitable so far. So it's still at an experimental level with um, Norway on the, for, on the forefront of these efforts. And, and the reasons why it hasn't been exploited uh, so far is because it's uh, costly. The technologies to harvest it uh, are not there yet. So these are also very uh, oily fish. So uh, harvesting them and processing them is a bit difficult. But with growing demand um, in our world for seafood and fast developing technologies, we are not certain for how much longer ocean twilight zone fishes will, will be protected. And there's also no convention or no management, no regulation, especially in the high seas for uh, for this fish at the moment. There, there are negotiations for the, the BBNJ uh, the, for biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions with the aim of protecting, among others, also the ocean twilight zone. Um, but the thing is that uh, the scientific knowledge is uh, very limited uh, so far. So we're just building the baseline on science as we speak. So once the, the baseline is established, then we will be able to know um, what is the effect of commercial fishing uh, or what has been lost. But by, by that time, it might be very problematic and late. So my role in this project is uh, to try and understand uh, through modeling the effects of uh, uh, potential harvest in the mesopelagic zone. I'm just going to quickly take another one that had to do with the invasive species in the in the Great Lakes. Uh, so that's definitely out of my area of expertise um, in the, uh, the Great Lakes. But uh, overall, um, I know that one of the big reasons that, uh, for uh, invasions in the Great Lakes has been uh, ballast water discharge. Um, and before the, the ballast discharge uh, regulations coming into force, uh, that require boats to, to exchange ballast water before entering the Great Lakes Basin. Um, th there was a continuum of uh, new invasive species uh, being established every six to eight months. And about 30% of invasive species in the Great Lakes have been introduced uh, through ballast water. Um, and in the early 90s, the, the US Coast Guard uh, began uh, demanding ships to, to exchange their ballast water. Uh, or see their ballast tanks for uh, the duration of the stay, which uh, um, has obviously ma made a big change. Um, and I don't know how we're doing on time, uh, but we can go back to the sustainable fishing issue or we can let uh, Stratos wrap up. Uh, I'm happy to take any more questions uh, on my email as well. And I'm sure Anastasia would do as well. We have also put some things in the in the chat, some links in the chat. So, um, by by all means. Thank you so much. Um, as for the remaining questions, um, I'm sure uh, they can also be typed as well. Um, so, because we are a little bit out of time, I would like to introduce to wrap up the event. So hello, I'm uh, Stratos Ethimiu, the Consul General of uh, Greece in, uh, in Boston, and I'm very happy because we had uh, a very informative, uh, but also frank uh, discussion on the Aegean, on the richness of, of, uh, of our seas, and on how to uh, protect uh, our environment in a sustainable uh, way. And I think that one of our strengths is that we can uh, talk in a frank manner uh, without hiding the problems under the rug. And I would like to uh, thank very much Professor Petros Vavakas from the Manuel Institute, uh, from the Eastern Mediterranean uh, Institute at the Manuel College for hosting and co-sponsoring this uh, 
uh, event. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, personally very proud of, uh, of the work of our researchers and uh, scientists uh, who dedicate uh, their work to a praiseworthy uh, scientific uh, cause, the preservation of our uh, world, our environment, and our marine ecosystem. Uh, this is an ecumenical and uh, global uh, challenge. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Melina Kurandidu for her presentation and her precious uh, scientific work uh, at the uh, world class um, uh, recognized uh, Woods Hole Institution. Uh, but of course, uh, this is a, an environmental cause with uh, apparent uh, local and more regional uh, dimensions. Uh, that concern the agency and its fisheries and marine environment. And I'm really grateful to Anastasia Miliu for her uh, work, for the journey she organized uh, in, uh, in the GN and on this uh, uh, exceptional uh, work they have uh, been doing at the Archipelagos Institute uh, work worth supporting, I would uh, uh, add. Uh, I hope that uh, we managed to uh, raise awareness about the challenges, uh, especially among the members of our community here in New England, uh, young but also older. And uh, I would like to send my warm regards to uh, Greece from uh, Boston uh, and uh, to wish a great uh, weekend to all our followers here in the rainy New England. All the best.